safety climate, um, I do oil and gas, but on my research I did agricultural workers um, because it's one of the highest incident rates and fatalities or loss of limb that there is. Um, the oil and gas uh, ranks really high as well as construction. Uh, Sixfold uh, in the last five years of injuries and incidents. We all think we're doing better, but we haven't had that far. Uh, so my research uh, used the uh, it's a Nordic safety climate uh, research instrument. It's free for anybody, simple to use. It's got an Excel spreadsheet that comes with it, and it's online. It's also available in 35 languages. So if you have employees that speak multiple languages or read in multiple languages and would prefer a different language, it's already available. Uh, with that, uh, there's a difference between safety culture and safety climate. Uh, safety climate is like a snapshot. You take a picture today of your environment, that is your safety climate. Culture is more in depth about how we work to, today and how our organization works overall. And if you have a culture that would rather not participate in safety or would rather do it the same way they've done it for 20 years, and that's your culture, but your safety climate is those perceptions of your employees right now. So if you want to know how your employees are responding to your environment or what they believe or what they perceive is going on with upper management, other employees, uh, subcontractors even, uh, you have to look at the climate at that time. Uh, it's a lot it's a lot of in-depthness, but your culture uh, is how our leadership behaviors occur. Our management looks at things. If you have a manager that goes, we're not going to do that, you know, we would prefer to do it this other way. We don't care what safety says. That's your culture. But your climate is that employee's perception. So if an employee perceives his manager isn't going to care what they do, isn't going to help him, he's probably going to start getting quiet and they're probably not going to voice their opinion and you start losing those employees that were actually good for your company because they'll start going to other jobs. They'll go somewhere else to get what they need in their Maslow's um, theory of hierarchy. If you're not feeding me what I need, then I'm gonna go find some job somewhere else. And that would be your safety climate. The instrument alone, the safety climate is 50 questions, which are really pretty quick to get through. And in that, uh, the person that's taking the, the survey instrument. It's their perceptions of how their manager views things, how they see the company uh, interacting with them, and then there's some other things that we'll go through in just a second, but there's seven uh, areas that you look at, and then they're easily graphed on uh, the Excel spreadsheet after you enter the numbers from your surveys. But the instrument alone doesn't tell you who those people are. They've never added demographics to their research because originally they didn't think that the demographics of who is responding to that instrument was that important. And just in the last five to 10 years, they started realizing that who is responding to the instrument is just as important as their perceptions. And with that in mind, and agriculture, oil and gas has a lot of different cultures coming from different regions of the world. And for example, like in pipeline, uh, we have some Mongolians that come in and they do nothing but tie-ins. And they're really good at their tie-ins. Of course, they speak nine languages, but they won't tell you that. But, you know, they come to your site and they do their job well. But you also have to realize their safety culture and their safety climate is not that well. And they still want to do it the way they want to do it. And you try to influence them. By <coughs> Uh, instructing them basically how to do it better. And if the culture of the organization, the superintendent on the job, the managers on the job don't promote you, then you're never going to get anything changed. The culture is going to stay the same. To get your climate to change, and thus later your culture to change, you're gonna to have to get those people, uh, they're gonna to have to believe that they're gonna be heard. If they're not heard, they're not going to listen. And their supervisors don't listen, their managers don't listen. So the instrument and research, um, some of the bigger gaps in research for safety or just how leadership even acts and responds to this world is that if you don't talk to the lowest man on the total pole, the middle man, and the top
talk all together and see what they're thinking and saying, then we don't know what our climate is. Because if our employees believe that the mid-supervisors and the management don't care, then your safety climate is stagnant. The same with the middleman is the one responding and being able to interact and promote safety. And the, and the new hires and people that actually you're out there, people going and doing your work, then you're not going to get anywhere. And, and it doesn't matter which way it is. Your whole organization has to have the same beliefs and the same goals to get anywhere. And that's where, you know, our companies, we can look at all of our companies and we can name that one manager that doesn't promote what we've said and don't listen to us. We can think of a couple of employees that you're like, no, that's a bad apple. It's always going to be a bad apple because they don't listen. And then you'll either have that VP or owner that's like, just get production done. I don't care how we get it done. It's going to be done by next Tuesday. I don't care what happens. And I've actually had a superintendent say, well, that was just another statistic as a guy died over there. And, you know, you as a safety person are the only one that's really there because that's our goal. Our goal is to be safe and we're there to promote safety and if you have people not listening then you know you're in a stagnant environment and i know i've put a bunch of stuff up here and you guys can read it but it's mainly the research that kind of focuses behind what i'm saying so if you guys want this you can have it uh, and my dissertation uh, has a whole section of just safety comment it tells you where all the theories came from how it interacts and how it goes back to leadership and exchange theory because if the leaders and the, and the members don't exchange information, you're never going to get anywhere. So you guys can watch this and I'll just keep talking. But um, safety culture is three aspects. You've got psychological, behavioral, and actually what's happening. But safety climate is only the middle one, how the behaviors are perceived. And I know everybody in this room is safety oriented because we're a safety organization. But with that, how many people can we influence every day? We influence by how we act, how we respond to things, and how we mentor and train other people. And with that, we have to do that every day. We can't be the one that's lax and not do something like not wear our safety glasses one day or uh, not promote safety in one meeting. Oh yeah, let's just go ahead and do it. We can't do that, we all know that. So for the one person that's always in the room is the safety person, that's got that goal. Everybody else in the room, probably on our page all the time, because they got things to do, people to get, and money to make. So with that in mind, we always have to be on our best behavior. And we always have to be the one that promotes safety. And uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you, know, you guys all do this every day. But with this, maybe we can understand what's all into the uh, aspect of getting the culture to change. We have to change all three things. We have to change the psychology, we have to change how we uh, perceive our environment, and then we have to kind uh, of the situational uh, avenues that we deal with every day. And a lot of companies have gone to zero accidents. I don't believe zero accidents because there's too many things in this world. We're driving down the street, we can't control the other thousand people on the highway with us, but we can best prepare on how we're going to respond when a car comes spinning out of control on the traffic lane towards us, or um, if we were on that plane that landed in the Hudson. You know, are we prepared? Do we pay attention to the safety lesson? When, if there's water outside, do we pay attention to which door we do not open? You know, all that is in that safety brochure, but if we're not paying attention, you know nobody else on the plane is paying attention. I'm surprised that many people were paying attention and followed the rules because they didn't have anybody die and that water was cold. But the same thing for us every day, for oil and gas, construction, manufacturing, or just going to your office or just taking your kid to school, every day we have to worry about that one thing that could happen to us today. And we, uh, he was, uh, Bo was talking about uh, somebody bringing a gun to work. We had a guy bring a gun to work. He even told his fellow people that he was working with that I'm going to F, F this guy today. And the only thing in his lunchbox was a 45. Didn't even put, the guy goes, I wonder why he's putting his lunch up on the dash of the pickup. 
his lunchbox is right there. So the guy moved his lunchbox, it was sealed. It was one of the big metal ones. That was like a, what I always call the, uh, definitely the hungry man's uh, metal container that actually is kind of insulated. So he picked it up just to move it in the truck. And he was like, that ain't no lunch in there. It's a loaded 45. Well, the other guy made a comment, you know, hey, this guy's not quite right today. So, me, I get a call and go, hey, guy out here with a 45 on the right of me, but it's in a lunchbox. We don't want to, you know, scare him. I'm like, lock the lunchbox up in some truck and throw the keys. I don't care what you do. Don't let him get back to his lunchbox. So, were we prepared? You know, we had 485 miles of pipe a right away from Cushing all the way to Houston. And now we've got a, a guy in the middle at a certain milepost marker with a guy. And you're like, why is he so far away from everybody? You know, there's no place in, you know, you know, close. And, you know, you tell your employees what to do, and your employees don't listen to you. I told my employees, get off the right away, take your happy butts, get in your car, and drive. What were they doing? Still sitting there when I got there. Still sitting there. You're sitting there going, what? What are you doing here? And so I get there. Before the police officers do it, I was a good 20 miles from even the county when I show up. And sure enough, loaded 45, asked him why on earth he was going to do this. He goes, I'm not going to take a look from him no more. And it's like, well, why didn't you say something to somebody? You know, I did. I told my roommates who worked there. They should have known. I'm not going to take a look off of him. So can it happen to you? Yes, it can happen to anybody in this room. It can happen in a mall. It can happen anywhere, but we have to be prepared. We have to be alert to our surroundings, and we have to, you know, it could, they could look like anybody. Like I said, it could look like anybody. But you have to be aware of signs and symptoms and appearances, and you have to protect you and your family, no matter where you're at. And that is why safety is us being prepared. It's not the policies we write, they're really important, but we have to be prepared and we have to promote that message to everybody, whether it's your little brother, your little sister, your big brother, your little, you know, big sister, your immediate family, that every day in this nation or wherever we travel, we have to be prepared. And so in that, you have psychological behaviors, you have just general behaviors that you're recognizing, and then you have the situation you're put in. And with that, we have to be alert at all times. Um, that psychological climate, um, it goes back to everything we've written and told them to do. Hopefully we've practiced it with them. Hopefully we've trained them. As you know, we have books probably this deep, and by the time you print them out, and they're all digital now, of policies and procedures for our company, lockout, tag out. How do you, you know, how do you have a meeting and you always started off with your safety topic down to how you close out a meeting. We have a policy for absolutely everything. And like you said, a lot of our policies never ever meet OSHA guidelines or standards. And like we're always told, OSHA guidelines and standards are mediocre. They're not excellent. They're not like making us perfect. But we have to keep uh, our mind alert to anything and everything. And we don't write policies on absolutely everything that happens. But we are supposed to, by standards, to edit our policies to ensure that they are meeting our situational conditions at our business. So if we have a situation where now a guy has run a gun, we'd sure better have a policy to follow up and edit our current policy to ensure that we're meeting those standards. And there's always research on all this, but like I said, safety climate is that snapshot. What's going on right now in your business and how people that are working for you, how the general public it, uh, it sees you as an employer or sees you as part of the community, all of that is taken into account for your safety climate. If um, we're out running our, our trucks up and down the road, speeding, driving down the middle of the road, often known as swerving for whatever reason because you know they're texting and driving, that is our safety climate perceived by the community because usually it's got a big huge sign on the side of your truck that says, hey, we're so-and-so. With that in mind, we're going back to these organizational characteristics perceived by all interested parties. Whoever sees us, whether or not we are just 
grandma driving down the road and she sees us acting out, she's going to perceive us as the one acting out. But, but she's a community member. Do we worry about that? A lot of times, no, we don't. A lot of times they don't call in on a number and say, hey, by the way, you've got some erratic driver or he's texting and driving. You know, most of those, if you've ever seen them, the pickup trucks that has literally, if you see anything wrong with this driver, please call this number. Have y'all always noticed that that number is missing? There is one character missing out that number just about every time because nobody wants to be called in on. Sometimes they've really corrected the number where it's nowhere near the number that was ever on the truck in the first place. And uh, with that in mind, <laughs> everybody's like, yeah, that happens all the time. We have to make sure our organization and our management and our employees all see that we are a part of the bigger, greater aspect of the world. And it's hard because they're like, that costs money. And they're like, that doesn't help production because they see the very narrow line and don't see the bigger picture. So for 35 years, a little bit over 35 years, we've had organizational theories come up about why we're safe or why we're not safe and what's organizational climate and what's not. Um, and there is so many. You would think that it, it becomes one big huge theory of multiple uh, ideas and thoughts and practices. And with that, I could only identify those in research. But uh, y'all can cut this PowerPoint later <laughs> because you cannot see it. I couldn't see it, but I couldn't cut it in the room. But anyway, we get down to safety climate. And the psychological climate was one total theory. So one guy just came up with that was the only reason safety occurs. So all of these uh, researchers, all these theorists, you know, they believed in one small aspect is why we have safety issues or safety problems or accidents. But y'all can get large that believe me, y'all can cut it right off that part. Um, with all of our industries, sixfold over the last 10 years in the number of deaths and injuries reported, you know, if you look at uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, it looks like, hey, yeah, we're not doing too bad. The graph kind of looks the same all along because, you know, they get it so crammed down in there that the line looks straight. It had got worse. Well, when you enlarge it, it's sixfold. You know, we're saying we're doing better, but statistics say we're killing and killing and killing more people, removing their arms and limbs, removing their feet, when we're not doing that good. And we, we need to be doing better, but until you get everybody on board, it's not gonna happen. Uh, agricultural injuries. A lot of times these are family-owned businesses, but there are huge businesses but when their son gets their hand cut off, do they report it to OSHA or do they report it to the Department of Agriculture? Do they follow those rules? No, he was just out there doing what we do as a family and he got his arm cut off in the combine. That isn't getting reported to the Department of Labor. And also, and, and I know you've probably heard about this overseas when you're on a boat and you're uh, doing some jobs overseas in oil and gas, you may not be that person if you're not if you got hit in the head right there and they just throw you off the ship right there. You're in international waters. Do you think they care about that person? They're out there working for minimum wage or their country's minimum wage. Um, and literally they get killed at work. And they're just going off the ship. It's no different. You've got people getting killed in a combine or something and we're not reporting it. That's just like throwing that life away. Nobody's learning from it, nobody's doing anything different. And so we need to fix that. Is it gonna get fixed in the next 10 or 15 years? Probably not. I mean, OSHA's been around since 1970. It slowly got better. We're not there. And disabling injuries. And I know if you're from a farming community, I'm from a farming community, and our population is 424, but our square miles are huge because of all the farms around it. The local uh, mechanic couldn't do any other job. When he was 16 or 18, he got his hand cut off in the combine because he was trying to get something unstuck out of the combine. Well, he didn't talk it out, didn't take the hydraulics off. You know, I'm just going to stick my hand in there and get that out. Didn't pull his hand back out. Everything was still in the, in the combine. And, that happens all the time. 
and, and you don't think about it happening all the time until my neighbor was mowing the lawn. She was this tall. I think she was 55 or 57 when she was out mowing the lawn. So she was mowing on a hill. You know that little thing that keeps the seat down that's supposed to disengage? Husband had taken that off. So when she got off the lawnmower, the PTO was still engaged, the lawnmower was still going. Well, she had parked it with emergency brake. She was down, they had a big pond. There was, she was down a few feet. Well, it started rolling, so she tried to get back on it. Topped her foot off. And not savable. But they healed her foot. A week later, she got a heart attack. Still footless, but the, the condition to her injury caused other problems that ended up killing her. Did that ever get reported? No, it's in her backyard. But it doesn't mean that we as safety people don't learn how to take the same information we preach it at, at the job, home, and spread it to our neighbors. And my OSHA instructor just this last week, he had chopped off two of his toes mowing the lawn with a push mower because he was doing it with tennis shoes. And he was my OSHA instructor. I said, you did what? He goes, yeah, I was stupid. Had tennis shoes on, push lawn mower, pushed it up the hill. He said, you never push it up the hill, you never go down the hill, go sideways. He said, well, I've learned this now, I'm missing two toes. But with that in mind, you know, we learn fast from our injuries, we really do. But we shouldn't have to have it as a personal injury before we realize we're doing it wrong, or teaching it wrong, or sharing it wrong. And uh, as our organizations grow, everybody in here likes to use subcontractors, because that way they're not on our OSHA 300 log, they're kind of paid out the side and get the job done, and they're a specialty contractor. Their safety, we, we can look at their numbers all day when they bid the job, if we're even bidding the job like that. But do we know how safe they are when those workers come out? Because typically they're getting them from a, a work facility, uh, uh, part-time. They haven't worked in forever. Job facility cannot do your job. Their safety record can be excellent on paper. But those weren't the employees that made that record. They've got new employees now. And we, we've got to keep that in mind when we hire subcontractors or other contractors to come in and do our work. They may look great on paper, but does that mean that they're going to work great on our job when they get there? Are they really prepared to work in our environment? Our high uh, incident, high exposure environment. used to, uh, our accidents were literally, you would go investigate them. What caused this accident? Yep, sure enough, car is going too fast. Accident report's done. Did we go into why they were driving fast? Why was the vehicle even going here to there? And um, how were they acting at this time? Were they not following rules? So as safety climate has increased, we start looking at bigger and bigger ideas of why this incident happened instead of just, well, it, he was just speeding and a third party hit him. Well, that can happen to any of us every day. There is always deeper, deeper ideas and theories about why. And so used to, we just literally looked at that little incident when we went to work. What happened right there? And we didn't look at why the supervisor wasn't supervising. We didn't look at uh, our policies and procedures that are currently in place, which we should be doing, we should be revising those all the time, especially if there's been a big incident occur. And, uh, and how many people now have digital uh, reporting, which you can never find that report again? Yeah, you, you file this big report on your tap root of your incident, and you ask somebody to go pull it back up so we can review it at the next incident. It was almost identical to it. We changed policy, we did everything. And you can't find the report that you did so much work on. You had a committee, you had the policy change, and they're like, well, that didn't happen. It didn't in the report, there's no report. Well, digital media is somewhere, people. And it's usually still on my computer, but somewhere it has got lost in the translation of the, of the digital world. And evidently we didn't share it enough, either by written or uh, some method of training, us don't do this again, especially when we lose limbs or lives. 
we need to really share that information and make sure we delve down into why did this occur this way with these people and try to prevent that from ever happening again. But as you can see, there's still lots of theories out there and lots of why we need to, to really know what's going on in our company. But we also need to be able to pull that stuff back up and share it. We need to share it when it happens, but we need to still share it. And we have all these tragedies in the world. And, you know, I was at the Oklahoma City bombing as a police officer in 95. Oklahoma never forgets, I promise you. For a week before the incident and a week after the incident, we will hear every second of what happened. At least somebody's perception. I have a totally different perception than the museum has because I was there. But that is reminding us. I don't, I'm not saying to dwell on somebody's death. You know, people need to heal. But we need to, we need to go back through why did we have this tragedy at work? Why are we in this situation again if it's the same thing happening in our work sites again? And uh, now there's two kinds of ways to look at our environment to see if our safety climate is positive or negative. You can have those people, supervisors, whoever, whoever your person is, go out and view. Like I'm viewing you guys to see if you guys are paying attention or not. Well, that's kind of like a safety climate. But I, if I am looking at you guys and trying to understand what you guys are doing, because it's my perceptions, it's not anybody else's. I've got a different background than everybody else in this room. We're all safety, but I've got a different background. When I look at you and see what you're doing, I would perceive it and write it down if I'm doing qualitative. Quantitative is that instrument that you use, and everybody's got the exact same questions and they have a choice of answers. Is one better than the other? No, but you've got to realize that it's perception. The person taking this quiz or the survey instrument, they have 50 questions. It's their perception is how they perceive work is going on today. This other research, qualitative, is somebody, a researcher coming out and watching you guys and going, oh, well, he's following this procedure and he's following that practice, her hair is back. It's not in the way of the, the manufacturing machines. She's wearing her pro uh, proper uniform. She's got her PPE on. You can do it that way, or you can do it that way, or you can do it both ways. Really, is there a difference? It depends on the eye of the behavior. You're going to get a lot of the same answers, but you may get more in depth with actually reading a survey instrument across the board with the exact same questions and answers for everybody, or the options to answer. So, this instrument, very easy to use, free on the internet. So is the answer guide, Excel spreadsheet, where you type in their answers. It makes up these nice charts. We'll look at the charts here in just a minute. But you have seven safety dimensions, which will be pinpointed on your uh, diagram here in a minute. But the person doing it, it doesn't matter what level they are in the organization, the person taking the quiz or your survey instrument is going to answer these seven characteristics out of 50 questions. So each one's got like five questions on each topic. And some are reverse scored, so they can't just go down and put one or five. So they're looking at management. So say I'm the, the lowest worker in the whole wide world. And when I did this research, they were like, you don't need to talk to the secretaries. They never go out in the, in the field. You don't need to talk to them. No, no, no. I really want to talk to the secretaries. They know everything. If y'all haven't figured this out yet, the secretary in any organization knows absolutely everything that's going on. And that and the janitor. If y'all don't believe me, y'all wait and look. The janitor and the secretary will be the ones that know everything in that building. They know the cubby holes, they know the hiding holes, and they know who's going to the bathroom and talking on the phone for four hours. They know everything. So if you want to know what's going on in your organization, go to the janitor and you go to the secretary. Promise you. Make friends with those two people, you will know everything. And everybody always told me I was joking about that. No, I'm not joking. I knew every secretary in the building, and I knew every janitor in the building, because that is who knows what's going on. And they'll also tell you what's going on in the VP's office. So, you know, if you're friends with them, you'll know everything. And our safety committee, you know who the secretary is on our safety committee? The vice president. His secretary was on our safety committee. So when she went back to the office and he said, well, what have you been doing for the last hour and a half for lunch? She 
she told him what we was doing in our meeting. <laughs> so she figured out how you can get sued for not doing your job. How you can, uh, if you're not, if you can't be, think you can't go to jail, you can go to jail if you're not doing your job. If you're not creating a safe work environment, you can, you can be civilly hit and you can be criminally hit. And she made a believe around him. I love that she was on my safety committee because things got done after that never got done before. So we're going to look at the perspective, how this person views uh, the management safety. How, do they have a priority on safety or do they not have a priority on safety? You'll know pretty quick because those questions pretty much nail it for you. Uh, do they have commitment to it or are they just saying, yeah, we're going to do it safe and then turn around and say, no, we got to get this done production-wise first. And whether or not they perceive them as being a competent manager. So that section is uh, safety climate one. Safety climate two is does your manager go, hey, we need to promote this and really believe it. You know, I need you to start training these people on this topic. We need to start engaging. We need to make sure that our employees realize, yes, we need to do that. That is our goal. And then safety justice. When I go out there and have a car wreck, are they gonna come at me and say, Brenda, you just had a car wreck. I was completely stopped in a, in a parking lot, legally stopped parking the car and somebody hits me. Justice. Are they gonna come at me saying, oh, well you shouldn't have been there at that date and time in that parking spot? Or are they gonna go, oh, I realized that you were stopped, you were legally parked, you were on job duties or whatever when you came back. Thank goodness you didn't get hurt. Justice can be either way. Either they are going to attack you for being in the wrong spot at the wrong time, or they're going to promote you and say, I'm sorry this happened to you, and go along with it. And then the four and five is the workers' perspectives. So if I'm a worker and I'm looking at my other workers, do they see safety commitment? Do they think that their fellow workers are safe? And do they think that safety is a priority, or, it, or do we just blow it off? So we've got four and five as other workers, how we perceive them. Six, uh, does the company as a whole, either the small group or the larger group, have safety communication, learning, mentoring, training that's effective? That's number six. And seven is, do they trust each other? Do they trust that the policies, procedures, training, mentoring is going to help them as a whole, or as a person, or as an employee, or as a human? And is there that trust there? Because trust is huge. So all of, in, in, in your research, you can do one or all seven at the same time. I would always suggest do all seven. Just because you'll find out a lot of stuff about your corporation you did not know because you're listening to your workers, your supervisors, your managers, or you're listening to your non-union and your union workers. When you do your demographics, you can switch it up any way you want to long as you add demographics to the study. So I kind of covered these already as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're going to kind of flip through those. But there's research backing each one of those as proof that it is part of safety climate. So here is our nice little chart and radar plot that comes out as soon as you enter it. And for this study, we had workers, managers, and supervision. So you've got all three levels of your hierarchy, and your uh, managers are also your owners, this is a small company. With this, you see the scores are all over, uh, they're all over 3.0. For this uh, instrument, it's one, it's lowest is zero, all the way to maximum of four. So when you're getting up into the three range, you're actually a pretty competent organization. And these people at all three levels believe the same thing at each level. So on worker safety commitment, it didn't matter if it was the workers, the managers, or the supervisors. Statistically speaking, those were the same responses. They're a little off. Uh, you see the red, the managers believe that they were more safe than the employees down here on uh, dimension four, safety level four. Their numbers are higher, but statistically they're the same. So there was no difference statistically. But with that, you can see uh, I should have put in a bad score because usually this was a family owned business, less than 450 people, a uh, large family. Each entity had its own entity. So 
each brother had his own little company inside the bigger corporation, and then the wives had their companies. And I should have chose wives against husbands because I bet you I could have found some differences because the women are way more at the job side than the men were. But I can't prove it statistically because I didn't pull them up that way. But I can tell you they knew everything that was going on in their businesses. When the men, you'd go up to ask them, and they were like, you need to ask him. The woman that owned the business, she was like, oh no, I can show you right here. This is what's going on in my business. Just different way of running it. And what's funny is the men were actually the family hierarchy, and the women were married into it, except for one of them. One woman was actually the hierarchy of the same family. The rest were wives. This is the same. This is direct and indirect workers. When um, I directly work for you, I'm an employee, not a subcontractor. That's the difference here. So you had direct employees that are truly an employee of that organization, indirect or indirect reporting, maybe the secretary that really doesn't have anything to do with the outside world, but she handles all the reporting in the outside world, uh, or she's the CPA or uh, another entity. So you can look at it as direct and indirect, is however you uh, do your demographics, and then make sure your demographics explains which one you're doing. And here, uh, we're trying to see if those managers, supervisors, and workers in totality had any differences of opinion. As of course we saw earlier, your managers think your safety club is wonderful. Same thing here, but statistically speaking, they were no different than the employees. But still, their scores were much higher because managers and supervisors believe those policies and procedures and actions are all they need to get done. And with that in mind, their mentality is, I have a safe organization because I have policies, procedures, and we haven't killed anybody yet today. That if you ask them those upper echelon, that's what they will tell you. We haven't heard anybody today. But do we do it tomorrow? So we have to make sure our safety is up there. And that instrument does not collect demographics. And these are some of the things that other research has found to affect demographics. Whether you're a smoker or a non-smoker affects your safety level. And smokers are high, more high risk than non-smokers. And gender is a, a different identifier. How big your family is. A lot of times if you have a bigger family and more people to support, you're a safer person because you're the one person that's bringing home the paycheck to ensure all of their safety in some cultures. Other cultures are over here to work and they do whatever they have to do and whatever they're told to get it done. And if they die today, they were trying. So it depends on which country of origin you're from. Years of tenure in the company, years of experience, uh, how you spend your work day. It, that, that means, am I being supervised every day? Or am I the person that is given a job task and you're sent 28 miles that direction and then after that task done you may go over that way 50 miles and you're never supervised. It's you, whether or not you're getting your job done is because they trust you or not. Or if you're sent to a different job, job location. And your full-time, part-time or seasonal employees, seasonal employees or your part-time employees or some place that some of these employees you're getting from uh, job sources are going to have a higher risk than the people that are actually employed. The other job is going to be detailed on whether or not they're doing what they're supposed to be doing today. And then, of course, your super your managers believe this your environment is more safe than your actual workers that are out there in the position of getting injured. There's the research statistics of where it came from. Uh, your younger workers are always at higher risk whether it's because they haven't been exposed, they haven't been mentored, they haven't been trained, they don't have that background, they may not have been raised doing these tasks and they have never done them so they don't do them safe because they just do what they have to do to get the job tasks they've been assigned done. And then he's gonna go talk about millennials on Wednesday. That's a whole different category. Um, the ones that can't do without their phone while they're sitting out there all the top of the room. Um, that's just a whole other atmosphere. 19 and 20 year olds in a high risk environment, more than likely you're going to have injuries and that's who's going to be them. They may not be the one injured, but they may cause that injury. 
you may be the poor soul next to them that you reach out to get them to stop something as the tragedy has already happened. Uh, and they don't listen. We all know that. They just, it's like talking to a teenager sometimes, they just don't listen. You know, well, I've ever had them say, I already know that, you don't need to tell me that. I hadn't even spoke yet, you don't even know what I'm fixing to tell you. But, you know, that's the millennials for you. Older married workers with a larger family that needs to support them are safer than uh, your younger workers. Here's the demographics I added. I added them because research says there's a huge gap. So there was 14 gaps in research. I tried to hit all of them. Um, age is one of them because a lot of people don't want to research age because they don't want to have age segregation or age uh, blame to work in it. And that's your work site. So walking and driving is the same path. So I don't remember where this is, I think it's West Virginia. But uh, when you start driving that car up that road, up that hill, you don't ever hit the brake and you don't ever slow down. And you hope nobody's up there because otherwise you roll to the bottom of the hill. I don't remember what this picture was. Oh, uh, this is a big squirt bell, so it's gonna be mulched on the right away. But uh, y'all can name the hazards there. You got water bars, that's just to keep your vehicle from it's not because it's going to rain here in the real near future. That's keep your vehicle from running all the way down to the bottom of that hill when your car stops or you don't have enough ump to get up to that hill. Beautiful out where we work. No matter where you are in the United States or Canada. And you can see the old right away because it's prettier. But you can see the old right away here and here in the path. And you guys will probably see that more often now if you start paying attention to it if you haven't paid attention before. All your electric lines go down a corridor. All pipelines go down a corridor throughout the United States. Uh, your transmission lines go to your houses and distribution lines. But for the most part, you've got huge areas like that. In underground, you've got five, eight pipelines underground. So we're working on top of live lines. You're working on top of you know, did we put a disc in the ground there? No. <laughs> but you've got your employees out there working in environments like this. And those can be lone workers because two of them may go out two miles walking down that right away and never ever see anybody. And you just hope they come in at night before it rains or before they get stuck out there. And, uh, and cell phone service does not work out very well. So satellite phones are needed. Uh, safety climate tools. You know, there's a lot out there. If you work in hospitals or other industries for you, or even pharmaceuticals, uh, University of Texas has a 10 question questionnaire. It's available free online. You'll just have to learn how to itemize it out and, and make your bullet points and your uh, graphs out of it. But um, they're very nice as well. They will help you. Um, matter of fact, if you probably turn in their research, they'll probably figure it out for you and tell you what your safety climate is just because they love to put that in their database. Um, but on this one, as in, in most of them, if your average mean score is low, you've got a lot of work to do. Even if it's in the mid threes, you still have voids in your system. There's still things out there that you really have not got done yet, or when you get new employees, turnover, people out having babies, people not coming back to work because they've retired, and those jobs are always constantly being filled. We're not in a perfect society where we have those employees all the time. You know, we got people coming and going all the time in your job sites. And uh, the Excel spreadsheets on that website. So if you have to, if you get to download, it's just great. But if you just look at uh, NOSAC250, it comes up in every language. You can read it in every language. And uh, all the documents are there. The Excel spreadsheets there. And uh, that instrument, as long as you don't use it commercially as you, as a consultant, selling it to somebody else, you can use it all day long. It's free. Uh, and it's available in 35 languages.